What's up, brand builders? Stephen Hurrahan here on the Brand Master Podcast. And in this episode, I'm speaking with SEO and customer research pioneer, Mr. Rand Fishkin. Now, for those of you who don't know him, Rand Fishkin is the founder and former CEO of Moz, a hugely popular SEO software. And he's also the founder and current CEO of SparkToro, a groundbreaking customer research software used by 1,400 agencies and teams. Ran is also the author of the Amazon five-star rated book, Lost and Founder, a painfully honest field guide to the startup world. Now, I've learned so much about SEO over the years from the quality content that Ran has produced, so I was absolutely delighted when he agreed to come on the podcast. And in our chat today, Ran shares his high-level tech and marketing insights on how to fuse modern and traditional forms of customer research, how to dig deeper beyond demographics and psychographics to find nuggets of gold, and how to reverse engineer the problem to build a more effective and practical buyer persona. Rand also lifts the hood and takes us for a spin on his customer research software, SparkToro, showing us how thousands of brand strategists and agencies use it for their clients. So if you want to learn how to enhance your customer research processes to find unique insights and opportunities you can use to build brands, from a top marketing and software pioneer, then stick around for this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, a show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast. And I'm absolutely delighted today to have Mr. Rand Fishkin on with us today. Rand, thank you so much for taking the time out to, to join us today. Yeah, my pleasure, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Now, we, we just had a, a brief chat uh, before we hit record, but uh, you know, I actually came across you, I, I don't know when it was, probably back in, I, I would say, if I had to have a stab in the dark, it would have been about 2014 when you were doing your whiteboard sessions with Moz. Uh, so it, it's great now, uh, you know, many years later to, to, to be chatting to you on the podcast today. Um, can you give us a, a bit of a background as to that journey from, from, you know, creating Moz and, and, you know, to then creating Spark Toro and, uh, you know, an audience research tool, give us a bit of a background as to, to that journey and, and why you ended up creating such a tool. Sure. Yeah. So I. Let's see, I started Moz back in 2003, so it, oh, it wow. was around for a while, uh, initially as a consulting firm, and then got into software. Uh, obviously, it was in the, the SEO software space, and I, I kept encountering this challenge where SEO couldn't solve their problems, right? Ranking in, in Google search engine was not good enough to solve their marketing problems, and a lot of the time that is because the product that they offer didn't have existing demand through mm-hmm. search. So they had to create that demand and search uh, is terrible at going out and, and creating demand for you. Mm. Um, simultaneously, I was uh, working with some some really smart agency folks actually, and saw this interesting um, application of a, of a technical and creative process that I thought was just genius, which was, you know, these these agencies would get lists, of customers, their clients, email uh, addresses, mm. customer databases. They would take that and they they'd run a giant overlap. So, oh, okay, of the twenty thousand people on your email list, uh, we found twenty five hundred uh, who had social social media addresses that we could match up, and we went and crawled all of those, and of those, sixteen percent subscribe to this YouTube channel. Mm. That's where we're going to do our marketing, right? That's that's where we're going to run our YouTube ads. And that's whose channel we're going to try and get you on as a, as a host or presenter or uh, as a guest, that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you would, you would do this across, you know, advertising, you do it across PR pitches. I thought, Stephen, I thought this was genius, mm. absolutely genius. And I also thought that it was goddamn insane that they're paying $150,000 and building their own private crawlers and doing all this identity resolution. I thought, well, why can't we just do that for the whole internet? Mm. And so that's that's what, what we how we built SparkToro. We basically said, okay, that is incredibly smart. 
being able to identify the you know public social profiles of your audience what a gift that data is invaluable to every kind of marketing let's go do it for the whole web mm. what we've done so far is really just the english language web but um yeah, it's already yeah. become and, and, yeah pretty invaluable for a lot of marketers. And I I I love the way you 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 kind of give the insights as to the amount of groundwork being done in the background just to get this kind of customer research because it 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 has been up up until this point, uh, you know, for depending on on what exactly you're searching for, quite a tedious job, but obviously. It's it's worth the effort to go to that, those kinds of lengths to find that information. Can, can you you give us your insight as to why detailed customer research or audience research is so important for brands today? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that I'm not sure it's a today thing. I think mm. this has always been extremely important. You know, in whatever in 1965, if you walked into Ogilvy and Mather. Right. And you said, hey, I want to run a you know giant ad campaign across the US. I'm Coca-Cola. You know, a lot of what they do would say, OK, where you know, what's the demographics and psychographics that we're trying to reach? And what's mm -hmm. the brand impression that we want to create? And where do we need to go to do that? And all right, we're going to have this much that we spend on print. We're going to have this much that we spend on television. We're going to do this radio. We're going to do billboard advertising. We're going to do in-store displays. We're going to do some guerrilla marketing. We're going to do some events. Right, all the sort of offline things, because mm -hmm. of course there was no internet. And then they, the, the whole idea of any sort of marketing or advertising is let's go tell the story that we need to tell, the one that's going to persuade our customers, get them to be aware of our brand, resonate with them, mm -hmm. get them to know us and like us and trust us. And then we, we better go tell that message in places that we know they pay attention. Mm -hmm. and, and audience research has always been about well, what are the places where this audience pays attention? You know, the Nielsen ratings in the 1970s and 80s was all about, okay, who watches what TV show when on what channel mm -hmm. so that, you know, you'd run TV advertising. The beautiful thing about the web is it got way more granular. You know, a lot of this data used to be you could go to the sources and, and find it directly. Now you really need to do something like this process mm. to figure it out, right? If you If you go and get many thousands of public accounts and you go visit those accounts, you can see what they do and how they behave and how they describe themselves and demographic data. Right. But um, yeah. yeah and, and, that, and, and look, and look the, the tools today are, is, is really what's, what's changing, you know, how, how the, the information that we, we can get and, and, you know, SparkToro is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, I don't think the fundamentals change too much. So, no. you know, you know, based on that, what is it that you, that you really like about the traditional methods of, of market research and, and what is it that you felt, you know, probably wasn't as helpful as, as it could have been? Yeah. So I, I mean, look, I think that every, certainly every product person, every entrepreneur, every creator should be doing some form of surveys and interviews. Mm. Um, and, and those are the right surveys and interviews being the traditional market research path. I, I have no problem with them. I think they're very good, but I don't think even the most, you know, um, fervent proponent of survey methodology, market research surveys would tell you, oh, well, yeah, you can just ask people what podcasts they listen to and they'll tell you. You can just ask them what YouTube channels they subscribe to. They'll tell you. You can ask them what websites they visit. You can ask them who they follow on Instagram. You'll get, at best, the best you could possibly do is maybe three or four, uh, ask people for three or four relevant you know, sources that they follow. If you asked 100 interior designers, hey, you know, tell me about the sources that you follow. Yeah, you might be able to find some overlap and mm. look across those and, you know, maybe get a list of 10 or 20 that your 100 people mentioned that were mentioned by more than two people. And then you could sort of guesstimate, okay, these are probably the top three or four, but what percent of interior mm. designers overall listen to them? Yeah. And you, you don't know. You don't know whether you've got a bias sample set right from your from your survey you're going to be talking to probably interior designers that are already in your 
whatever, in your network or on your social list or on your email list or uh, in your geography. And networks are always biased. Mm. So that, you know, this surveys are great for a lot of things. Interviews are great for a lot of things, but this is something they are terrible at. Yeah. They cannot tell you where you can reliably do your marketing to reach a group of people that you don't already reach. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty with hitting the internet for because the behaviors are out there and it, it gives us scale and the quantitative information that, you know, that, that you just can't compete with, with those, you know, with those surveys. And, and, you know, that's, that's really where you get that mass information. You can find those nuggets of gold where, where clusters of, of your audience are, are gathering and, and, you know, your competitors might not be aware of, of this information. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really being able to, it, and that's the beauty of it today. It, it's all at our fingertips. I mean, you know, the, the job that, that, that business owners had to do years ago to find that information, small business owners, you know, it, it just wasn't available to them. So it's, it's great that, that small businesses have this information as well. And uh, on the, the, the demographics and psychographic side of things, because again, that's going back to the traditional way of doing things. We've always looked at the demographics and psychographics. Do you still feel that that's, that's really beneficial and what kind of useful insights can we pull from those two? It depends who you are, Mm. right? So for certain, for a lot of mass market consumer brands, people who are doing, you know, big brand ad campaigns, um, some of that demographic stuff is useful to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, SparkToro, actually, we're a little funny in this regard. So for uh, primarily ethical reasons, we provide some demographics, but it's very basic. So we have, for example, like um, age, gender, uh, education, interests, Mm -hmm. which I guess is psychographic, um, and geography. But we do not do things like um, race, sexuality, uh, religion, mm. um, political affiliations, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. And that is because we believe those are ripe for abuse. Mm. And there would be a lot of uh, bad actors who would take advantage of that and use it in ways that um, even if it would bring us lots of subscriptions and make us money, we're, we have no interest in contributing to that uh, and never will. And so, so you you guys have yeah. the, have the opposite approach to to Zuckerberg and and the whole you know Facebook empire and all of that massive data that they have, which is great because look at the end of the day, I mean, I think we, that, we're, we are marketers, yeah. but but we we get it because we're we're part of the big machine as well. Well, and and look, like I don't, <laughs> um, I think that a lot of folks like Mark Zuckerberg believe that the goal of life is to maximize capitalist revenue and growth from you know a, a business engine mm-hmm. and frankly i i think of it the opposite way right which is that small scale capitalism is designed to enable people like us to build interesting businesses that hopefully are fun for us to run and let us work with people that we love and have clients that we like and do the things that we want to do in the world um mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I, w- <laughs> I to be frank, I really I really wish that uh, I think that it's actually the job of government to step in and help people like Zuckerberg um, or you know or Google or or Microsoft or Apple, Amazon, whatever, to sort of act a little bit more like a small business. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, instead of a monopoly, to, to to help the likes of Zuckerberg have those ethical values that yeah. you know obviously spark toro are adopting without that governmental pressure yeah i mean i think that uh unfettered capitalism un- unregulated capitalism works terribly mm. like absolutely terribly as bad as any other system uh you could name out there but well regulated small scale capitalism you know whatever I, I, lots of small <laughs> businesses competing with each other you get from competition comes lots of beautiful things. This is actually a big part of Star- Spark Toro's ethos too, Stephen. Mm. Like we are trying to say, don't just throw all your money at Google and Facebook and Amazon, mm. all your advertising dollars. Go find the place, the sources of influence yourself, and go directly pay those creators and and publications and 
uh, do your advertising direct to them. You don't need to put your money in the you know big tech monopoly basket. Mm. And frankly, you can get better results because of it. They're 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 just a middleman. Yeah, yeah, th that's exactly right. They're they're a middleman with with all of that data. And it, it, by the, by the sounds of it, I've, I've touched on a, 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 an area that you're passionate about. You could probably sit down at a bar and talk about for 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 hours on end. It's probably another episode entirely. Um, but it, you mean we're not going to have a socioeconomic political debate? <laughs> I felt it coming, and I was like, "I've got all these questions. Keep on track." But uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, I, I could, I could, I could, I could follow that rabbit hole with you. Episode and, uh, two, and, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> now, going beyond demographics and psychographics, because look, we try to paint a picture of who our audience is. We look at, you know, the the circumstances of their lives through their demographics and you know the the behaviors of their lives through psychographics but really when it comes to making those connections with our audience we want to go deeper than that we want to get down to the to the nitty-gritty those challenges those emotions that they go through how can we drill down past the demographics and psychographics with modern techniques uh so actually i think this is where you refer to classic techniques okay this is something that Surveys and interviews have been doing well for a hundred years, mm. and I would urge people to keep using them as tools to figure out the emotions behind how people understand. I think one of the best things that you can possibly do as a marketer is do just what product people do, and that is talk to your customers, mm. talk to your potential customers, talk to your customers as sources of influence, talk to people who don't even know about your brand. Ask them why they make decisions, why they choose certain things, what resonates with them. Have friendly conversations that just expose their uh, existence in your universe, right? Ar around your topic areas. And you will start to gain empathy for like, oh yeah, gosh, you know, a lot of interior designers really struggle with, you know, the relationship with the builder. Mm -hmm. And none of my competitors are talking about their, that. They're not thinking about builder friendly materials they're not thinking about builder relationships they're just trying to please what they think are the interior designers customers which is the end client uh, the homeowner yeah gosh is there an opportunity for us there could we do something that would really let that message sink in unlike the rest of your providers we do this thing that serves this need that our competitors didn't know you had mm. I, I think that that's the kind of um you know, emotional and uh, psychographic information that is impossible to get from, mm. you know, whatever, um, large scale data sources like a Spark Toro. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the one thing I might look at is I might look at things like uh, the words and phrases that people use in their posts and shares. Mm -hmm. And I might look at, um, you know, pages that are resonating sort of, oh, this is a trending piece in the industry gosh mm -hmm. okay there that must have hit home with a lot of folks in okay. our field yeah that that sort of thing but really surveys and interviews man yeah that's that's where and that's and, and i love that as well because you know it really pulls back into focus the idea that you know the 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 quality of the answers that you get is in direct correlation to the quality of the questions that you ask and if you're yeah. asking really good questions, then you can get some insights that your competitors just can't compete with, even if they're scraping the same information on a quality or a quantitative level. You know, just digging deep and asking those questions just really gives you a feel for who these people are and the challenges that they're they're going through. So I absolutely love that. Now, when it, when it comes to us doing all of this research, buyer personas, you know uh customer avatars uh you know however many synonyms you can kind of think of for for in and around the same thing what 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 are your thoughts on that because within our marketing industry you've got a lot of different opinions you've always got a lot of opinions on on every little piece within our industry but certainly with with buyer personas what are your thoughts on them and how can we make them better so that they're a little bit more actionable or 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 applicable to what we do as marketers yeah, I, I really feel like personas should be created specifically to solve the problems that you want to solve rather than made in kind of a template format and then given to whatever product folks and marketing folks 
to say, oh, well, this is the target audience that we're going after. Mm -hmm. You know, let's. Um, so, so as in, as in, who are the people that are going through this specific challenge right now? Or how how is that? Um, how does that unfold? Yeah. So a little less. Who are the specific people going through it? The way I think about it is, you are a marketer. You're trying to solve the problem of where do I reach my target audience? Mm. Maybe what I need is an audience persona that says, you know, X percent of my audience pays attention to these websites in this order and these podcasts and these YouTube channels. Or you're a product person and you are crafting uh, a solution. And so what you want is sort of uh, interview and survey data and then, and then market research data layered on top of that that shows you, hey, there's this many uh, people with this particular type of problem and this particular type of job role that they're fulfilling. Mm. And the job that they have to be done is this one. And so, okay, if we can solve, here's the pain points that they experience around that job. And here's the alternatives that they're currently using or considering using. I think that's way more valuable than like, you know, here's sales Sally and she has two kids and a mm. dog and she really likes her Starbucks latte in the morning. <laughs> And she, you know, the, those classic personas are very, very strange to me because they don't map directly from a um, problem that, that you need to solve mm. uh, over to why does the persona exist? Okay, so start 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 with the problem and build. Start with the, the problem, the, the not the persona. persona. Uh, build a persona around the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, if you don't even have to call it persona, mm. you can just say, right, here's the problem I need to solve. What is the data that I need to solve that with? Yeah. Is a classic persona the fit for that? The answer is almost never. Mm. I think the classic persona came about because it was memorable and um, it fits this format of how we like to imagine, you know, fictitious human beings and we can pass it around the office and be like, here, here's the the avatar of the person of our target customer. And to be mm. frank, it's just not helpful. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, like the the reason the reason that I that I went in search of you, Rand, and and that's exactly what I did. I I, I was like, get me get me Rand's uh, Rand's email address is because you know audience research is you know it, it it's it's a big part of building a brand of of being a brand strategist or a marketing strategist to really find that information. That we can then use to connect the business with that customer that we're we're going after, and I I know that you know it, it's it really takes a lot of legwork out of the research that we do. I'm wondering if you, if you'd be able to to kind of jump on and, and walk us through Spark Toro from a strategist point of view or somebody who is trying to find you know, this information for their clients so that they can then go on and build the brand for them and kind of talk us through what we can do with the tool and and, and how we can use it, reports that we might be able to run and things like that. Does that sound, uh, does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. So let's go share our screen here. All right. So you hopefully are able to see Spark yes. Toro now. Yep. Great. Excellent. And I'm going to move this over here. Um, so what SparkToro is, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a giant database of public social profiles. So mm. 82,936,000 right now. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can search across it. So you could say, you know, my audience frequently talks about something, which means that they uh, post about that frequently when they, whatever, send a tweet or uh, post a Facebook message or... Um, post to LinkedIn, post to Instagram, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you could ask for people who use a word in their profile. So for example, you know, when we were talking before, we said in, oops, interior designer. Mm. Uh, and so you know, au an audience that uses the word in their profile, we have 13,872 people who use interior designer in their profile. That would be like their Instagram about or, or, their, or their Facebook. Um, uh, Facebook page, Facebook bio, Twitter bio, those kinds of places. Mm. And then you can see a whole bunch of behaviors and demographics. So what SparkToro is doing is extremely simple here, Stephen. It's just 
this data is just a pain in the butt to get, right? If yes. you had to go out and manually oh, crawl. Oh, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, 14,000 uh, folks and then try and run the overlap, that would take you a lot longer than the four seconds that it took me to type it in here, yes, right? And that's, absolutely. that's what's handy about this. So then you could see things like, okay, gender distribution. Mm. So 60% women, 25% men, uh, a, you know, percent and a half non-binary, and we have 15% where we, we haven't been able to assign a gender, which isn't surprising. Lots of public profiles don't specifically state a gender and don't have um, sort of passive information that you could use to get that. And then job roles and fields. Okay, no surprise. Design, most mentioned skills, space planning. Mm. Right. Awesome. Okay. Space planning, interior design, architecture, interior architecture, furniture, and residential design. And you can see all sorts of things about, you know, hashtags that are used. So you might say to yourself, hey, to better understand this audience, I think maybe I should be following the hashtag lighting on a few, a bunch of these different uh, platforms. And I'm actually going to try and every day see what the top few you know, posts and tweets and Instagram shares are around lighting because that looks like it's a really interesting one to my particular audience. Mm. Or you might run ads against it, uh, or you might use it as a hashtag that you use when you put up your own public posts. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And you might say, oh, well, this stuff is obvious. It's really not obvious. I, I, I can tell you that very rarely, you know, if you were to ask someone, even who's a market expert, Hey, what are what do you think are the top five most used hashtags in a particular field? They'll usually get one or two right, mm. and then if you ask them for the top fifty, they'll get like four. Out of 50. And, and and even with the the space planning on the 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 skill sets for those interior, uh, if if you're a strategist and you're 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 digging into um, you know an industry that you've not worked with before. And you're doing all this research, you can learn so much from this information oh, that yeah. you wouldn't otherwise come across because space planning is not some, you know, it's not a term that I've come across before and I would not link that immediately. So, you know, there, there's, there's so I, much. I would that you think it was something up. to do with NASA. Yes, right? that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, being able to see this is, you know, is just incredible. And, you know, we're talking about one little section, right? Hashtags. Uh, what YouTube channels are popular with interior designers? Mm. I have no idea, but when I click on the YouTube tab, oh, look at that, 12% pay attention to or, or subscribe to House Beautiful, which makes sense, and Design Milk, which I, I don't know anything about, but it looks interesting. Uh, we could certainly check it out, right? I assume it's something to do with interior design. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, so Toto Innovation, right? The, the Japanese toilet maker, Bosk's new kitchen appliance technology, uh, Courtyard homes, elegance of Helvetica, brave mm. new world of design. Like this, this looks super relevant. And you can see most of these have 10 to 100,000 or more views. This seems like an excellent, excellent channel for us to whatever participate in, try to pitch to cover our new service, try to um, learn from. It's probably a good one to advertise against in our, you know, our Google ads. So this is, okay, house, which I, I'm familiar with, apartment therapy, Arch Daily. You can do the same thing in you know, podcasts. And you can target um, all of these through ads. You can, you can provide a report to clients saying, listen, you know, if you're going to go down the YouTube ads road or if that's part of the service that you're offering as well, it just gives you that report to, to put on a plate to your client to, to show them the depth of the work that you've gone to to find the information on the exact type of people that they're trying to to get in front of that that is exactly exactly right so you know if you a ton of our customers for spark toro are agencies consultants brand strategists and what they will do is they will take these you know they'll go click click you know i want this one i want that one i want that one i'm going to add them to my list right and then then they put it in a list of you know whatever it is uh interior design targets mm. and then they from that list go build a little mini presentation to show to their client to say here you go client Beautiful. this is exactly or, or you know or they'll just go screenshot yeah select podcasts all right there you go put that in the presentation yeah, that, right? that's paste. it and, and the value of that is yeah it, it's 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 great I, i'm i'm loving the 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 
you know, the, the convenience of having all of this information at your fingertips, it's great. Yeah. So uh, that, that's really, that's really what it's about. It's about taking a process that was, you know, six months, two engineers, identity resolution services and incre- a, a big Amazon web services bill, right? And turning it into something that any business and as small or as big as you want can, you know, uh, use. In fact, the free version of SparkToro is robust enough that people can even use it for that without paying us a dime, right? And nice. and that was something that's very important to us because we want people to be able to uh, do that. There, there, and, you know, we, we've only walked through one particular thing, but you could say, you could, for example, you know, go here and say, okay, well, I'm really interested in, you know, the people who use the hashtag home decor, which might be broader than interior designers, but I really want people only in California mm. because, you know, California is where we're going to be doing our targeting. So let's start there. Okay, here's a thousand people who frequently use the hashtag home decor and they're located in California. And maybe we, you know, we don't have enough people for a, a demographic distribution. We, uh, if the audience, if we can't match, uh, I think it's three or 400 profiles through uh, LinkedIn, which is where most of our demographics come from, we won't show you uh, demographics so as not to potentially reveal someone's identity. Mm-hmm. But all the rest of the data is here. So you can like, Okay, if I want to reach people interested in home decor in California, gosh, it looks like L Decor and InteriorDesign.net and you know Dwell Apartment Therapy Style at Home Better Homes and Gardens, right? Like a lot of people I've heard of um, in this space are are pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of talk about real estate. <laughs> yeah, that is that's something we didn't see with the interior designer set mm. because I think that. You know, home decor probably has a, a little bit of a different uh, bent there. And yeah, you can see those hashtags change up a lot too. For example, I don't see lighting in here. I do see hashtag Los Angeles hmm. um, and San Diego, right? So y- you can refine, you can get down to, you know, oh gosh, a lot of people who are talking about interiors right now are talking about mid-century. They're talking about mortgage rates. They're talking about curb appeal. Uh, eco- ecologically friendly is in here credit scores because mortgage rates have gone up recently, right? Mm. Um, Bathroom and kitchen remodels, spring clean. So, you you know, you're getting a bunch of interesting stuff. So, uh, and useful. So can you, can you tell us a little bit, bit about um, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll probably get you. uh, uh, Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe you'll be able to, to stay on here. Maybe there'll be some, some information, but tell us about how Spark Toro, Toro is helping brand builders to enhance their research and what, what kind of results are you seeing? Because you obviously speak to your customers all the time now. Um, what, yeah. what are they saying to you that they're, they're finding most valuable about what they're getting? Yeah. So um, for a lot of folks, the value from SparkToro comes specifically from being able to, comp- to accomplish one task or another. So that task might be, hey, I'm running a YouTube ad campaign in this particular sector, I need to optimize that ad campaign. I want you to show me, you know, words and phrases and hashtags that are popular. I want you to show me demographics. And I want to see those YouTube channels across all these different audiences so that I can do better targeting on YouTube mm. and so that I can learn from the channels that are having success. Wonderful. Yeah. Then there's folks who are who are creators, right? They're content marketers, uh, content strategists, and they are essentially writing blog posts and filming videos and you know sending tweets and posting you know updates on LinkedIn right if they're especially uh, in B2B that's that's very big and what they're trying to do is learn what resonates with their audience so they want to see topics and hashtags but they also want to see which accounts are popular and go try and get amplification from those accounts and see what those accounts are doing that's having so much success mm. reaching the audience that they want to reach mm. um you can see a whole bunch of folks who use SparkToro specifically from the uh, what I'd call like brand intelligence yeah. sort of standpoint, and that's and that's where them, that's where really uh, the presenting. big bulk of our our audience is. Yeah, yeah, totally right. So for them, um, you know, there's there's an agency actually that I was just talking to uh, uh, that's in the brand space a couple of weeks ago, and what they really use SparkToro for is to give an overall picture of. Uh, the 
competitive environment mm -hmm. and how their client can stand out mm -hmm. potentially in a field, right? So they might say, hey, your audience looks like this, right? So my audience follows the social account and they put in their client. And then they'll go and say, here's your top five competitors, mm -hmm. direct competitors. And here's your top five media competitors, like the people who are producing media in the space and, and sort of building audiences, uh, not necessarily competing against you on product. Mm. And then they will present that to the client and say, here's how we think you can stand out in the space, be unique, mm. have a positioning that is um, a, a unique value proposition compared to your competition. Yeah. And here's places where they're present, where you're not. And here's places where you can be present that they're not present. Mm. Uh, and they'll you know, give some information on the sizing of spaces too, right? So they might say, gosh, you know, there's whatever your interior design, they might look across hashtags and phrases and say, a lot more people are talking about mid-century design than are talking about Scandinavian design. Mm. So um, maybe that's an opportunity actually to lean on Scandinavian design as a unique value proposition, or alternatively, maybe it's a good opportunity for them to pick the bigger one yeah. and go into that field. So it it's it, it, it's great. And, and I'm, I'm delighted that you touched on the positioning side of things because uh, being able to see the competitors, you know, that, that are competing on the media side of things as, as well as, you know, directly in the market, it just gives you that, that little bit more information that when you sit down to really define why your brand is different compared to the rest, you've got all of that information there and that makes it easier to see those gaps and opportunities in the market as well. So yeah, I think I think being data informed yes. um, makes you, especially as a brand strategist, makes you really stand out from people who are kind of, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to say, you know, fluff, but that there is a certain amount to brand strategy in general, and mm -hmm. I'm guilty of it myself, that is, look, I can't explain to you why exactly this is going to work, but I can tell you just from a human psychology standpoint that it is going to work, mm -hmm. that this is the way we should go. I, I, and what Spark, Spark Toro helps you do is say, here's some data behind. And that's what we need. That is the, like really to give what, because branding is fluffy. I'm, I'm, I'm the first, the first one to say yeah. it. it's, it's so hard to quantify. We understand it, but then you know, relaying that to the to the client is is so difficult. But the more tools we have to give evidence to what we're actually saying, the better we all are for it. So uh, this is I a really lot of brand that. strategists that I know use Google Trends and Google Search mm -hmm. data, right, to try and show, hey, here is how people are searching for this particular topic. Mm. And what SparkToro is able to do is say a lot of activity on the web does not happen exclusively through search. A ton of it is happening on whatever, Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and mm. Facebook and YouTube and Reddit and blah, 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 blah. And that stuff is not search. It's not someone saying, I want this thing right now, Google, give it to me, mm -hmm. right? It's people having a conversation. Yeah. It's them posting about something. It's them following a hashtag. It's them following an account. And that activity is very difficult to quantify mm -hmm. if you don't have a product like this, yeah. right? So there's competitors to SparkToro. You can certainly use them if you've got a big budget. Um, Brandwatch has an awesome audience research mm -hmm. uh, tool. Yeah. Uh, if you are on a smaller budget, you can look at um, Audience with an S or Helixa.ai, both of which have some overlap with mm -hmm. what SparkToro does. You can look at similar web, which yep. is different from SparkToro, but has a lot of clickstream data around like what websites people visit and how popular those are. So there are options, right? You can put data behind this stuff. Um, but I think that marketing, it's so weird how marketing's flipped in the last 20 years. You know, 20 years ago, trying to convince whatever, a brand to go invest in SEO or invest in digital marketing was incredibly difficult. Data mm. didn't help help you, right? They were used to advertising where they're used to advertising. And now everyone expects data. Yes. And so when you try and bring this like, you know, brand strategy, positioning, um, mm -hmm. market research approach, it sometimes falls on deaf ears unless you can show the numbers. Yeah. And 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 I I I can 100 percent testify to that because so many 
business owners, you know, they 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 push away if they can't see those metrics. They're 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 hooked on metrics now because digital marketing today has yeah. given them that they're it's like a drug that they they need those metrics and without those metrics. And 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 I get it. I get it. And and this gives brand strategists who deal more in the world of perceptions and and uh, you know uh Per personas that that we work with to, to try and extract that information, it, it gives us more weight to what we're saying, and, and in some cases, what we know to be true, and, and this then backing it up. So it's 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 really good that that this tool is 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 out there now, and it's obviously going to grow and evolve over time. So uh, thank you so much for for taking the time to to show us that, to to give us your insights on audience research, and. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a link in the description of, of the video in the show notes of, of where uh, listeners, they can go and get a free trial, right? And they can, they can test it out for themselves. Uh, we don't have a free trial. We oh, just sorry. have a forever free version. A forever free version. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so even, no even trial, better, even better. Put in a credit card. Yeah. Lovely. Much better. Lovely. Yep. You can just use it for free for forever. Okay, so I'm going to drop that in in the, the show notes. If anybody has any follow-up questions or want to get in touch with you directly, Rand, what's the best place for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, I'm just Rand at sparktoro.com. Um, you can certainly, I, I'm most active socially on uh, Twitter where I'm at Rand Fish. And if you, if you write into support, there's only three of us who work at SparkToro. So uh, chances are very good that I'll reply to your email. Well, no doubt you have someone full time on email because if you're giving your email out freely like that, and you have got nope. a much, uh, I just have me. You just have you. That's that's brilliant. I love it. Um, yeah. Ran, it's been an absolute pleasure. As I said, you know, um, from following your stuff way back uh, on the whiteboard uh, sessions to to getting the those insights about Spark Toro, it's it's been an absolute pleasure and hugely valuable for the audience as well. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Stephen. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills, make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com. There's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened. And make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast.